God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. And please also join in the Easter greeting. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He has risen indeed. We please join with me in prayer. Holy God, you speak to us in a voice unexpected and come to us in ways we do not recognize never leaving us to our own devices or defenses. You are the ever-present, all-powerful God. Call us out in faith again until we learn to walk with you in steadfast love and faithfulness and in peace. We pray in the name of him who feeds us in barren places and quiets our storms. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. It is wonderful to be in worship with you. We are glad that you are joining us wherever you are at this morning. A few announcements to draw your attention to. The first one is St. Mark will continue to follow the advice and instruction of the CDC and the St. Louis County government. And as such, we are nearing the end of April, getting ready for May. And in an exercise of of doing no harm and keeping our members and our guests safe. We are looking to have all the activities in May either be canceled or postponed. We'll have more information on our social media, on our webpage, on all various ways that we communicate with the congregation. So if you ever have a question about what is going on or question about things going on later on in the summer, do not hesitate to contact myself, Pastor MP, the church office, and we will make sure to get back to you with what we know and when we know it. So uh, there's information about May and about the activities uh, being postponed or canceled. Also, uh, information in the bulletin about other activities that we have going on, uh, activities for Isaiah 58, activities for Again, the Lenten Water Challenge, there's still an opportunity to contribute to that. And there's information in the bulletin about per capita giving here in the church. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in attending, your faithfulness in being a part of the St. Mark Spark, your faithfulness in serving your neighbors and those around you in need, your faithfulness in prayer. It is all appreciated. It is all needed. We're glad that you all are with us. We're glad that you are participating. Please make a note in the comment section of the YouTube video or in the live stream chat that you are watching us, that you are participating to let us know that you are joining your voices, your hearts, and your prayers with us. Let us now continue with the call to worship. Good morning. Let us join together in our responsive call to worship. God speaks peace to the faithful, to those who turn to God in their hearts. Surely salvation is at hand for those who fear God. Where God dwells, steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. God gives what is good, and we respond with abundant praise. Now let us join together singing God is Calling Through the Whisper. If you have a hymnal in your home, it is 410 in your hymnal.
Let us join now in our confession of faith. God judges all people impartially according to their deeds. Trusting in God's love in Jesus Christ, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Gracious God, you call us to step out in faith, trusting in you for all things. We respond to your command, but then sink in doubt and fear. We hide from the challenges of bold discipleship. We are not able to fulfill your commandments, for our purposes are never in full accord with yours. Forgive us, we pray, when we confess with our lips, but do not believe in our hearts. Help us to practice our faith in all circumstances. Lift us out of sin into the arms of your mercy. Though we are distracted by noise all around, allow us to hear your voice, even when it is the sound of sheer silence. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us take a moment now to confess silently. Followers of Jesus, God has promised salvation to all of us, to our children, and to all who are near and far. Hear the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Jesus said, my peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Friends, may this peace, the peace of Christ, be with you. Let us pray together. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. I was thinking a lot recently about dangerous jobs, the work of those in the military, police officers, firefighters, and as revealed in this pandemic, the work of doctors and nurses, of EMTs, and all those who work to restore the wholeness and the health of those in our communities. Now, I don't think those jobs are alone in being dangerous. And certainly, if we look back to the Old Testament, we look back to the Hebrew Scriptures, we are going to find some perilous jobs, some hazardous jobs. Perhaps the most dangerous one is the work of a prophet, a true prophet of God. Now, a prophet is not a fortune teller. A prophet is not a soothsayer. A prophet is not a diviner. This is not someone that is paid to tell our future. Instead, what a prophet's job is, is to speak God's word and God's truth into a world that is not able or is not willing to listen. And so we turn to chapter 15 of the, stor the story in our journey together. It is titled God's Messengers, and it covers a whole lot of ground. These are the individuals that God chose to speak truth to power. And these men often paid the price through hardship and isolation, depression, and in many cases, death as well. There was a plethora of choices of individuals we could have learned about today, but I'm going to focus on Elijah, and we're going to hear a part of his story in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 15. Listen now as God speaks to us through God's Word. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, 
so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of these by this time tomorrow. And then Elijah was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and he ate and he drank again. And then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. And then the word of the Lord came to him saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind. So strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your commandment, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. May this God's word speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Where are the prophets? Where are the prophetic voices nowadays? Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel famously sang the words. The words of the prophets are written on the subway walls and the tenement halls. These are the voices advocating for the poor and the displaced, the despised, the marginalized, the condemned, and the hurting. Words that are sung, spoken, and shouted by God's messengers. We ask the question, where are the prophets nowadays? The question might just as well be put, where are ears to hear? Now, I'd love to say, I would love to say that pastors do this every week 
in pulpits all across the nation. And in fairness, there are still prophetic voices out there with names we do not know and names we do. Names like Martin Luther King Jr., William Sloan Coffin, and others. Our nation turns its lonely eyes to them. However, if we are honest with ourselves and that the church is honest with itself, much of our history is about maintaining the status quo in religion, in government, in society, and in commerce. The church too often has sided with leaders like Ahab and Jezebel because they offer the best opportunity to keep the status quo and to keep things safe and normal. The question for us, not just today, but really over the past month, month and a half, where are we to go? What are we to do when there is no status quo anymore? What are we to do when the structures that we have created, that we have relied upon, have crumbled? What are we to do when the towers of Babel that we have erected and we climb to the top and we realize there is nothing there? What do we do when the neon gods of consumerism, consumption, production, and busyness the ones that we have made, what do we do when those lights go out? The psalmist ask the question, where are you, God? Where is God? Now the question for us today, are we talking about the God of creation or are we talking about the cultural gods, the Baal gods of culture that are around us? Where is God? Where are the prophets? And are any of us willing to listen to those voices splitting the night air? My hope is we can learn from Elijah, the prophetic voice calling out. And maybe, just maybe, one of the unintended consequences or blessings of this time in these hard times is we have an opportunity now to listen when other noise leaves us. The story that is immediately before what we heard from today is about a dramatic showdown on Mount Carmel. It is a confrontation between Elijah, who is by himself, who is a prophet of the one true God, and on the other side are 450 prophets of the false god Baal this idol of Canaanite worship. And you had at the beginning of the contest this 450, these 450 prophets crying out. They screamed, they cut themselves, and they moved in a frenzy to get their God to answer, to consume the offering that they had prepared for it. But nothing happened. And when they were done, Elijah And one voice, one solitary voice calls out to God and fire comes down from heaven and it consumes the whole offering. It consumes everything around it. And all of Israel was amazed at what they saw. And they heeded Elijah's call to kill the false prophets of the local counterfeit God. And that's where we pick up our story today. Because Elijah was a prophet and he was prophesying against the actions of Ahab and Jezebel, these deplorable despots that were up in Israel. And when they see what has happened to the prophets of Baal, their favorites, they are not happy with the outcome of the contest. And they want a pound of flesh from the prophets. And Elijah runs for his life. He crosses the border into Judah. Now, Elijah has just won this incredible victory. God has done amazing things. He is on the right side of history and the right side of God. It is a victory. He has won the Super Bowl of prophets. An underdog defeating the heavily favored enemy. But Elijah is not going to Disneyland. 
He's going back into the wilderness. He is more despondent than ever. Our reading continues with Elijah essentially saying, Hello, darkness, my old friend. Here is a prophet who has been attacked on all sides for so much of his life. He has lost his home. He has lost many of his colleagues. It seems now, even after this victory, that he has lost hope. Elijah is done. You might as well stick a fork in him. He has completely had his fill. His soul is empty. He has run his race, maybe not to the very end, but at this point, he wishes it was the end for him. He is spent and he is empty. He feels so alone that he lies down even under a solitary broom tree. Even the tree stands alone and he falls asleep. And then a vision softly creeping. It leads, leaves its seed while Elijah is sleeping. And there is a vision. A vision that comes as an angel appears and tells Elijah to get up. To get up and to eat and drink. And he goes back to sleep. And he, again, the angel says, get up, Elijah, or else the journey will be too long for you. You need food for what is ahead. And so he eats again. You can add this to the times where in the past Elijah has been fed by ravens in the wilderness who fed him down by the wadi. To the widow in Zarephath who provided for him in a time of famine. In all the long roads that Elijah has traveled, God has provided for him. Now what lays ahead for the prophet is a 40-day journey through the wilderness. Eventually, he will get to Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai. And if that sounds familiar, we cannot help but think of God's divine encounter with Moses on that holy mountain. And so Elijah begins to walk. The writer Kurt Vonnegut once said, strange travel suggestions are dancing lessons from God. Strange travel suggestions are dancing lessons from God. It essentially meaning that sometimes those places that are unfamiliar to us, those places where God sends us to go out into, there's an opportunity to learn and to grow, to sing, and yes, even to dance as God greets us in those unfamiliar spots. And Elijah gets there, and the word of the, of the, the, word of the Lord comes to him saying, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Clearly, God has directed him to come, but the question is, but why are you here? And then Elijah shares. In fact, he does this twice before and after the divine encounter. Elijah says, I have done everything you have asked. I have done everything you have asked. They have killed the prophets. They have torn down your altars. They're worshiping false gods. I've done everything in Israel that you want, and now even they want to take away my life. Where is your God? The psalmist says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? There's more truth to this passage from 1 Kings chapter 19. More truth, I think, today than what I preached at last. Because in this quiet time, the disquieted inside of us can be louder. When anxiety and despair, dejection, the voices in our head and in our heart they tell us we are all alone. Their attitude, that constant noise coming from within and without, that we are not good enough. They join together with a cacophony of sounds that draw, drown out hope and sink us under the heavy, heavy waves of worry. Where is your God? 
What are you doing here? And there are times, honestly, when we are honest with ourselves and with God, when we wonder why we cannot answer. Where is God and what are we doing here? Where is the faith that used to come so easily? Why do my words like silent raindrops fall? You see, because in this pandemic, there are additional darknesses that we have to fight against. We have to work against. There is individual depression, but also there is a collective malaise. Elijah walked a long 40 days in the valley to get to the mountain, to get to the base of the mountain. And as I look out at an empty sanctuary, I'm glad that you are joining us virtually. But as I look out at an empty sanctuary, I am reminded that it's been 49 days since we've been together. Since we have been in this individual and collective valley. We know what it's like. And the word of the Lord after that journey comes to Elijah and says, Go, go and stand on the mountaintop because God is about to pass by. God is about to come on the scene. God is about to show up. And so Elijah does. And and as Elijah gets where Elijah needs to be, suddenly the Scripture says there is a violent wind. A wind that is so strong that it is breaking rocks. It is splitting up the mountaintops. But the Scripture says God was not in that wind. And after that wind, there is an earthquake But God is not in that earthquake. And after the earthquake, there is a consuming fire. But God is not there either. An earthquake, wind, and fire. Isn't that what we expect God to be? These these symbols of anger, these symbols of destruction, these symbols of, of a God that somehow or another, in some way or another, in the church or in the culture we have, have placed upon ourselves a God who is punitive and wants to get back at us for our missteps. Isn't that why weather forecasters call hurricanes and blizzards and floods? We don't know what to call them, so we call them acts of God. This was a, a question that was, was posed to me many times after the Joplin tornado. The question was, was God the one who sent it? Was God the one in the wind whipping through town? Was God in the earth shaking underneath our feet? Was God in the fires that burned? The best I could do was to keep pointing back to Elijah. Keep turning back and, and pointing back to 1 Kings chapter 19 that God was not in any of them. And now we've been in this long enough where people internet preachers and televangelists and others who are asking that question, is God causing this pandemic? And if so, why? Where is your God? Why are you standing here? The truth of the matter is, while God reveals God's self to Elijah on that mountain, God never left him. God was with him in famine. God was with him in turmoil and the threat of violence. God never left Elijah. And I believe God never leaves us. God fed the prophet in unexpected places and unexpected ways. God never left. And looking back in our own lives, Perhaps we can say the same. So if not the violent wind, not the earthquake, not the fire, where is God? At last it is in the sound of sheer silence. The sound of sheer silence, God appears. Some translations have called it the still small voice, but the NRSV is more bold in its translation, saying that it was utter and complete silence. 
For a prophet with a soul that is disquieted, this is divine peace. For a man with his world turned upside down, there was comfort. There was hope for the hopeless in the stillness. God who was still there. What are you doing here, Elijah? The work is not done. You are not alone. God's self-revelation on that mountaintop, God's self-revelation in Jesus Christ is not the end of our trip. It is food for the journey. So when you feel like you are trapped in quarantine or depression, when you feel like you are alone, abandoned, solitary, when you feel attacked on all sides, when your very soul is disquieted within you, when you hear people ask, where is your God, and you don't feel like you have a good enough answer, and when your soul cannot even muster a sound, a heartfelt word through parched throats, know, know this, the story of Elijah, the story of the prophets, the story of this whole thing called God's plan for humanity is that God is still speaking when we need to hear all the louder when the familiar voices and noise is gone. God is breaking through in new ways. God may not be in the violent wind, the quaking ground, or the mighty fire, but I believe and I have faith that God will see us through these times into the quiet, into God's presence, strengthened to go to the places where God needs us to be, God is not done with Elijah. God is not done with the world. And God is not done with us. Let us all be willing to listen as God speaks through these sounds of silence. In the name of the Father, of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Now we come to the time in our worship service where, if you are able, we stand together to affirm our faith. This week we are affirming our faith with the Westminster Confession of Faith Shorter Catechism. Question 1. What is our chief end? Our chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. If you stood, please go ahead and find a comfy seat. Now, as a reminder, as we enter this time of offering, we are still open for business, as to say, and the office is open. So your gifts, if sent, can be sent to the office. You can find a way to give on our website at www.discoverstmark.org. You can also give us a call or reach out to find out how you can use your time, your talents, and your treasures during this time of quarantine. So as we prepare ourselves to lift our gifts before God, let our hearts be overjoyed at the miracle of all of our gifts being mingled together. They bring release to the captives and freedom to the oppressed and good news to the poor. Let us pray. Generous God, clothe us with joy in the knowledge that we make a difference through the gifts that we share. May these gifts be used for the glory of your name. Amen. Let us pray together. Lord, we give you thanks that you are the God who spoke the world into existence. You are the God who created everything out of nothing. You are the God who spoke through prophets. You are the God who spoke through your Son, the Word of God, Jesus Christ. You are the God who spoke through Pentecost. 
And You are the God who is speaking still. And so we pray now, asking You that You continue, God of healing and peace, that You would move in our lives, that You would speak in our darkness, that You would shine Your light into difficult and hard situations. We ask, O oh God, that You give the church strength for this day, for the facing of this hour, but also, Lord, a vision, a vision to go where You are calling us Strange places, perhaps, moved from the unfamiliar. Lord, let us not seek simply to strive to go back to the way things were, but know, God, that You are calling us to be better and to do better. Help us, Lord, to act in ways that honor You. We pray, God, for Your world. We pray, God, for the well-being of leaders and workers. We pray, God, for teachers and for peacemakers. We pray, God, for parents and artists, healthcare workers, those who deliver our mail and our food. We pray, God, that we might seek to love our neighbors as ourselves that You would turn our hearts to respect and honor those who are not like us. Let us see in peoples of every nation the majesty, the majesty of Your desire for richness amidst these differences, that You created us all fearfully and wonderfully. And may we see the image of God in all of our neighbors across borders and across the street. We pray for bodies and spirits to be healed, for those who are in pain, for those awaiting surgery, for those who are struggling with physical therapy and isolation, for those who are awaiting death, and for those who have passed. We thank You, Lord, that You are the God of all of creation. And we pray, Lord, that You would speak Your peace into our hearts now as we lift up our individual prayer silently to you. Lord, we ask that You be with all of our prayer requests for those that we have spoken aloud, for those that we have lifted silently to You, for those that You alone know, God. We ask that You hear our prayer and that You be with us as we, Your disciples, pray the prayer You taught all, saying, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be Thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy, thy will be done. Be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to please rise as you are able for our Second and final hymn, hymn number 451, Open My Eyes That I May See.
invite you to please rise as you are able for the charge and the benediction. Go out into a world, a world that is filled with heartache, a world that is filled with suffering, a world which so much, so right now, is filled with uncertainty. Go out into that world and may the peace of Christ reign in you, shine through you, live in you. Go out into the world knowing that the God who has brought you this far still has a plan for you this day, has a plan for the world. Go out into the world and be the church, loving each other, serving God, being kind. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may it be with you this day, this life, and always. Amen.